Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we love you. We praise you. We thank you. Indeed, we believe that you are almighty God. You are seated on your throne in heaven, Jesus. You are seated at the right hand of the Father. And Holy Spirit, you emanate out of the Father and the Son, bringing them to us and bringing us to them, that we might come boldly to the throne of grace in our time of need to receive mercy and find grace. We praise you and thank you uh, that when we speak to you, you speak back to us. When we call out, you respond. If we ask, uh, we receive. If we seek, we find. If we not, the door is open. And you don't just pour out words or even a little bit of knowledge. You pour out your power and you intervene in our lives in incredible ways. We come here today, dear God, for such a moment as that, not simply to be cerebral and to think about you and to ponder you and to meditate upon you and maybe gain a little wisdom. We come to have a life-saving encounter with you in our circumstances, in our relationships, in our physical bodies, and eternally through the Holy Spirit. We pray, dear God, for nothing less than that today through this word, that you would encourage us, enlighten us, draw us close to you, fill us with expectations, anticipation of the wonderful things you want to do in our life. We thank you and praise you in advance for answering these prayers. It's in Jesus' name. Amen. It seems to me, as we've gone through the Gospel of Matthew all these weeks, um, the Lord keeps upping my anticipation and my expectation about how he wants to work through this series, how he wants to work through my ministry, my teaching and preaching ministry, how he wants to work through our time in worship, how he wants to work through altar calls, which is something that we're going to do more and more increasingly when we can take these masks off and bring people back in the building but even before then, we can do it now in the little bit of space we have around our chairs and what our, um, our TV audience, so to speak, has around them where they are, so we don't have to wait on that. He's filled me with expectation, anticipation about how he wants to work in our D groups, where people don't just get together and have a good time and talk about Jesus, but actually pray and experience transcendence in those places where the power of God comes down and begins to speak through the members of the group, through spiritual gifts, and you guys begin to pray for each other and see breakthroughs and power and wisdom and healing and so many other things. As I go through this gospel and I think about the future of this church, um, I recognize that it lies entirely in the hands of God, and we will either rise or fall based on the fact that he either shows up or he doesn't show up. If indeed we're two or more gathered together in his name, his presence, his spirit is there, and that manifests and wonderful acts of power that bring healing, healing and salvation in our circumstances and in our lives eternally, then, then we have a bright future. But if we continue to just get together and, and God doesn't show up and there's no real change, there's no real metamorphosis in who we are, there's no change in our character, there's no change in our circumstances, there's no change in our heart and our mind, then what's the point? You know, the Apostle Paul said the kingdom of God is not simply about talking, it's about power, and so I'm filled with expectation and anticipation about how God wants to work. The title of this week's message, and the theme is very similar to what it has been for many weeks, is that Jesus can and Jesus will. Jesus can do anything, and Jesus will do anything for you. Not anything you want, whenever you want, but what he desires to do to intervene in your circumstances and my circumstances to bring salvation. He absolutely can. He is powerful enough to do so. And he absolutely will because he has the desire to use that power, that authority, and acts of loving kindness. He continues to do so by the power of the Holy Spirit now as we see that he did so many times in the Gospels. And the only thing, the only hindrance to that power being dispensed upon us often has to do with our faith. Some of you will say, and you, I'm repeating myself, but I, I kind of have to repeat myself because y'all don't get it on the first pass. It reminds me of a story of a preacher who was hired by this church. They, they brought him in to audition him, and he did this great sermon, and they were like, he's going to be great, so they hired him. And then he came back the first week, and he did the same sermon again. And they're like, okay, well, maybe he forgot, but that was good. It was good, even better the second time. And they brought him in the third week, and he did the same sermon again. And the fourth week, and the fifth week, and the sixth week. And it was always good. But finally, the elders pulled him aside, and they said, Hey, do, do you have any more sermons? He goes, Oh, I have lots more sermons. And they said, Well, when are you going to preach them? He goes, When you get that one. You know, so um, sometimes I feel like in this gospel, we're in repeated scenes that continue to say similar things, but we're not getting it. And so thank you, Jesus, for being a little bit redundant in your ministry so that we stay in these themes, we stay in these ideas, and we really learn uh, what you have to say to us. 
But anyway, I, you may think that God can, but maybe he won't, at least not for you. Maybe you think that you're not worthy. Maybe you have a self-esteem issue. To which I would say, if you're put on this planet on earth, you were put here on purpose and for a purpose, you were given special dignity, uh, you're worth it to God. Maybe you think that your problem is too big for God, to which he laughs in your face, right? Because he's the God that raises people from the dead. He can do anything. He spoke the world into existence, like there's nothing happening in this world that he can't overcome. Maybe you think that your sin is too big, or the sin that was committed against you is too big. And so you have doubts, or you have fears, and you know that God will show up for other people, but you don't think that he will show up for you. And what I would say to you is that you do not know the immensity of his love. You have not grabbed the greatness of his power, and you don't understand the sufficiency of his cross. So continue to dive into the word. Continue to allow the Holy Spirit to work in your heart and bring you to a, fa a place of faith in his words that allows grace uh, to come into your life. There is no question that he can. There is no question that he will. The only question is when and how. We cannot control when God will move, and we cannot control how God will move. We can't go to God with our issue, with our problem, our circumstances, our relationships, and, and, and write our own prescription for the remedy. We've got to let him speak from his own wisdom and his own power according to his own will, according to his own timing to bring the salvation he desires in our life. I think many times the problem isn't around us, the problem is in us. And I think so many times we're looking for God to change somebody else or to change our circumstances, but the one he really wants to change is us. And I tell you, the greatest gift by far is not for God to change your circumstances. The greatest gift by far is for God to change you, to give you or me peace, joy, contentment, patience, and all the wonderful attributes of the Holy Spirit, even as we exist in an imperfect world. Those are gifts and strength and power that go beyond circumstance and are really the ultimate gift from God. So I can't promise you when and I can't promise you how, but I can promise you that he can and I can promise you that he will. I can promise you that he has the power and I can promise you that he has the desire and I can promise you that there are a lot of miracles that we have not experienced simply because we have not believed. Now, one of the reasons that I struggle with this, and we will get to a sermon eventually, one of the reasons I struggle with this is because um, there's a culture that has existed in the American church around these things, these ideas such as prosperity and healing and miracles and, and things like that. There's a culture that has um, kind of come out of the American church that is unhealthy and exploitive, and the theology is off. They call it the prosperity gospel, and we, we, we won't go into the details about all that's wrong with that, but whenever I write a sermon like this, I struggle because I begin to feel like I'm starting to sound like them, and I know that so many of them are off, but I feel like the Lord has been showing me that they're not all off and not all off all the time. In other words, there is some truth to what they're saying. It may only be a half-truth, which is incredibly terrible, um, but it's not all that it seems. Two nights ago, Friday night, this is a legitimate story, I had a dream, and in my dream... There was a prominent prosperity pastor or preacher that if I said his name, many of you would know. You would never admit that you watched him, but you probably do. And uh, this prominent pastor, had, he was losing everything. He had lost everything. And he had lost all of his money, and he was standing in a place, and he was speaking kind of like when he would typically speak but instead of being filled with joy he was filled with sorrow and he was weeping because he had lost everything and you kept waiting for him to turn it around and you know you know blow the eight faith and get people to give him money and kind of come out of it but he just wept and he wept and he wept and then at the end of it he just played a song and he repented i literally had this dream it was crystal clear the lord showed me who it was and some circumstances around it we'll see if it ever happens if it's prophetic or not but when i woke up just after i woke up after having that dream uh, the Lord told me that he's going to take uh, some of his prosperity teachers that truly love him but who have become deceived and he's going to call he's going to bless them by causing the prosperity preacher to quit prospering and bring them to their senses and cause them to repent 
and then from that place of humility, hone in, improve their theology, and then set them back out with powerful preaching and teaching ministries to bring people all the way through to the end. Because it's how he wants to build his kingdom. It's how he's going to build this church. He does not want it to be simply on men talking or dry, dead theology. He wants it to be power in his presence according to the will and the ways of God, according to his timing and his place. You know, some of us pray for people to get healed and then they die and then we wonder why God didn't answer our prayer. And he's like, that was the best answer you could have gotten. They're with me forever, right? So it's not like what maybe we think it is, but God wants to build his kingdom, his church, in this way. And he's chosen us, you and I, to be the poster children for salvation. We get to be the ones through whom he's going to advertise. And so when we get up and talk about how God brought us out of sin and into life, brought us out of bad character, into good character, healed our mortal bodies uh, so that we have a little bit longer on this earth, gave us a fresh perspective, gave us a new attitude, restored our marriage, brought our kids out of darkness. When we tell these stories, it'll be all glory to God, and it will invite people into the kingdom of God to believe that the same God can and will for them. And that... I, I, that, I would say everything I just said frames up my heart for ministry and what I expect and what I anticipate and what God, I believe, expects from me to lay before you as an expectation as well. It's a little bit scary because if this isn't real, we're going we're gonna to fail. But I would rather fail than continue to do something for many years that's not real, that's man-made or fabricated. Okay, so into the teaching for this week. We're in Matthew chapter 8, and we're going to begin where we ended last time we were together in this passage, which is in verse 23, with Jesus um, escaping Capernaum in the crowds that had gathered there for his ministry and heading east across the Sea of Galilee towards the Decapolis uh, with just his disciples for a little more intense and deep teaching just for them. In verse 23, it says that then Jesus got in the boat, left Capernaum, um, and his disciples followed him. And as a way of reminding you, remember there were two so-called or would-be disciples that you know, said they would go with him under different circumstances, but they didn't. They remained frozen on the banks of the sea, unable to get in the boat because of either their unbelief or their unwillingness to pay the price. And they were about to miss some really cool stuff because they stayed there. But we didn't. We continue on with Jesus. Let's pretend we got on the boat. In verse 24, suddenly a furious storm came up on the lake so that the waves swept over the boat. But Jesus was sleeping. Jesus was unfazed. Now, it's hard for me to believe. I don't know exactly what kind of boat he was on, but I've been to the Sea of Galilee, and I've seen the type of boats that they typically cruise around on that sea with, and they're not very big. And, and I don't know. Again, I haven't done as much research maybe as I should, but it seems to me that if he was laying in the bow of one of these boats, he was getting wet. He was feeling the wind, he was feeling the water, yet he was laying there and he was so unfazed and he was so tired. Remember, he had just made the statement, birds have nests, uh, foxes have holes, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. I think he was just like, man, I'm going to have to sleep on that boat tonight. I think that's what he was thinking about at that moment. Anyway, he was unfazed, but it's hard for me to believe that he was utterly unaware, but it was as if he was setting up an opportunity with his disciples because, you know, Jesus was like that. He was always orchestrating something. I would call him manipulative, but he's the son of God, so I'll just say that he was sovereign. In verse 25, it says the disciples went and woke him. Like, how can, how can he sleep? He's wet, and it's scary. So the disciples went and woke him, saying, Lord, save us. We're going to drown. To which he replied, you of little faith, why are you so afraid? This is a wonderful opportunity for him to show something about himself. Then he got up, and he rebuked the wind and the waves, and it was completely calm. And even though these guys had seen Jesus do amazing things, they were even more amazed by this. The men were amazed and asked, what kind of man is this? Even the wind and waves obey him. Now, I can't help but wonder if this is when John began to formulate the ideas and the understanding, the insight, the revelation that led him to start his gospel in John chapter 1-1 the way he did. 
Because here they are, they're on this boat, and they've seen that Jesus has a certain level of power, a certain level of authority over creatures, over people to heal them. But now they're seeing that this authority is expanded beyond what they imagined because he has authority over all of creation. In John chapter 1, beginning in verse 1, it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And through him all things were made, and apart from him nothing has been made that has been made. He was with God in the beginning. In him was life, and that life was the light of man. And that's John in chapter 1 connecting who Jesus is with Genesis chapter 1 with who God is in creation. And he's saying that word that spoke the world into existence now comes and lives among us and has been made flesh. It's an extraordinary revelation, extraordinary thing to understand. He was you know, here, I would say, in this boat experiencing this and beginning to connect the dots. Wait a minute, this isn't a guy who just has authority in creation. This is a guy who has authority over creation. Oh my gosh, this is the creator. And yes, he was with the Father, but he's also equal to the Father. He was with God the Father, but he is also God. And he was with the Father when the Father made the earth through the power of the Holy Spirit that hovered there. But he was also the one speaking from the heart of the Father over creation. Now, I'm thinking about those old boys that stayed on the, on the shore in their unbelief and their unwillingness to pay the price. Like, they missed this greater revelation. You know, when we believe with what we have and take the next step, it brings us to a place where we will see and perceive and understand even greater things. In other words, faith grows or it dies. And with the faith that they had, the disciples got in the boat and went east with Jesus. And through every experience they had, they gained knowledge, they gained understanding, they gained revelation. Like, if you want to know more about God, take what you have, move forward with it, and he'll meet you along the way. That's really not even the message today, but this expanded sense of his authority is. Now, the good news is, not just knowing that Jesus has that kind of power, It's knowing that he rose from the dead, ascended into heaven, and is now seated at the right hand of the Father. He pours out the Holy Spirit, and he sits there, and he intervenes on our behalf. In other words, he is still incredibly active and and aware of us and dispensing this kind of almighty power in this era of grace for us rather than against us. This is the good news of the gospel of Matthew and all the gospels that the kingdom of heaven has come near. It is here through Jesus, now by the power of the Holy Spirit and the power and the authority of that kingdom, which is almighty over all of creation, continues to exist and work for us when we bring ourselves into submission to it through faith. That's some pretty exciting stuff. Every time I talk to God about current events lately, the, the pandemic, specifically, the racial unrest, specifically. More recently, I've been praying a lot about the fires in California, and he seems more attentive to those prayers because that's actually affecting people that I care about and that he cares about in a way that is quite existential and immediate, and it's not just philosophical. It's not, it's not, a, it's not a fraud. It's, it's a real fire. But especially when it comes to the pandemic and the racial unrest, every time I speak to God about it, the conversation seems to me very short. This is just my own personal experience. It's like he doesn't want to talk about it. It's like he's laying in the boat <laughs> and he's unfazed. It's not that he's unaware. He's just unfazed by it. He showed me in Scripture, I told you there'd be days like these. Oh, you of little faith. Don't you know I can stand up and I can speak over creation anytime I want and subdue anything? If I don't, I have a purpose in it. All things work for good for those who are called according to his purposes. He's unfazed. It's not that he's unaware. I think he sees it as an opportunity to illustrate that the kingdom of heaven marches boldly on even while the world is on fire. And for some of us, I'm looking in your eyes, and I'm honest with myself and looking in the mirror in my eyes as well, it's as if we regret that we're alive at such a time as this. Oh, if we could just go back to the good old days. What, 1968, the Watts riots? 
Would you rather have been around when Noah had to build that ark? Or when Adam was expelled from the garden? There's nothing new under the sun. Sin repeats itself. We reach a climax from time to time. We think Jesus is going to come any moment, but the end is still to come. Like these things come and these things go. And by the way, this particular time, these particular events, and us existing now, were preordained by God for us to give Him glory. For us not to be unfazed, for us not to be phased, for us to be unfazed, see it as an opportunity to march boldly on by grace through faith in His words as they were empowered by the Holy Spirit to advance the kingdom of heaven while the world is on fire and to greatly glorify God through the salvation he brings in and through our lives, right? So he's unfazed. He continues to be unfazed. We're amazed. He's unfazed, and he's like, you should have known all along. Moving on with the story. It gets even better. Part two. When he arrived on the other side in the region of uh, the Gadarenes, and yes, I did have to practice that several times before I could say it this week, two demon-possessed men coming from the tombs met him. They were so violent that no one could pass that way. Uh, We know from Luke chapter 8 and from Mark chapter 5, they talked about one demon-possessed man. So it seems that one of the two men who were demon-possessed, one of them was especially violent. And and when Jesus spoke to the man, it was as if he was speaking to the demons that existed inside of the man. And they said, he said, asked who they were to identify themselves. And they were many. They were a legion. A legion in the Roman army could have been three to 6,000 soldiers. I don't know what a legion is when it comes to demons, but it was many, many, many demons in these two men. And so they came uh, to the other side uh, of the lake, and they came into this region just outside of town in this area, this place where the tombs were. And one of these guys, they had been trying to Uh, put him in chains and to bind him because he was so dangerous but he kept breaking the chains he had this supernatural demonic power and so they existed over in the tombs and the people steered away from them but as Jesus came across the lake he steered right into them this was his mission he wanted to show his disciples something about his power and his authority and what he would use it for and what he had authority over which wasn't just for Jews and their healing but it was over Gentiles in the entire world so he steered right into this this was the advanced teaching of those who got on the boat with Jesus. In verse 29, what do you want with us, son of God? They shouted, plural, being the demons, by the way, and not the men. The men's mouths were like microphones and their lungs were like amplifiers to just speak on behalf of the legion. Have you come here to torture us before the appointed time? Now, that's one verse, but we can learn a lot from that verse. The first thing we know, because this isn't the men speaking, this is the demon speaking, they know when they see Jesus, even in his human form, that he is the Son of God. They know that he is the Son of God, and they know him, the Son of God. They knew him before they fell with Satan. They likely were present with him in the throne room when he spoke the world into existence. They knew who he was, They knew the power he had, and they knew the authority that he had. No one else had made quite a statement like this before these men, but it wasn't them. It was the demons inside of them. They knew who the Son of God was. They understood that the day would come, that he would descend from heaven to earth to bring judgment on them and on all of creation. They knew the time would come. There was an appointed time that he would come with his power, with his authority to bring judgment and punishment and condemnation. They sensed, though they could not have known, you know, absolutely clearly, they sensed that that time hadn't come yet. They probably knew the scriptures and the prophecies and they had insight and they had understanding. I know, you know, the devil is probably the best theologian on earth except that he doesn't understand the category of theology that we call soteriology, which is salvation theology, which is grace. He's mystified by grace, and, and, and so are his minions. They know who he is. They know the power he has. They know the authority he has. They know that he will use eventually one day that power and authority to, con- to judge and to condemn, but they are mystified that he would come ever to dispense grace, to use that power and authority for us rather than against us 
even in full view of the cross and the church and everything that's happened through the arrows, the, the, the devil continues to be, Satan continues to be, evil continues to be mystified by grace. Now, this is important because you may have really good theology, but not understand grace. And you may think you're in a right relationship with God, but because you don't think he will use his power for you, and those you love you don't believe in the sufficiency of the cross perhaps as much as you should then maybe what is influencing you is not god but the evil one masquerading as an angel of the light or masquerading as a theologian we've got to believe in the goodness of god what do you want with us son of god have you come to torture us before the appointed time some distance from them a large herd of pigs was feeding i remember when i preached this the first time from this passage I don't think the message was anything like this, but I remember <laughs> I preached this passage in California in the Golden State Theater there, and we had a lot of people there that day, and something weird happened. I got to this part, and somebody's phone rang, and the ringtone was set to squealing pigs. It was really bizarre. I'll never forget that. It spooked me. I don't think I've ever preached it since, so this is... Turn your phones off. Some distance from them, a large herd of pigs was feeding. The demons begged Jesus... If you drive us out, send us into the herd of pigs. So they're concerned. If we, it's really helpful sometimes to cross-reference these passages and read again in in other gospels. So like Mark and Luke, uh, what they were concerned about specifically, what was mentioned in those gospels, that's not mentioned in this one, is they were concerned that Jesus was going to cast them out of these men and throw them into the abyss. And the abyss is some kind of penitentiary. It's some kind of spiritual holding place uh, that is. Um, where demons go and are held so that they can't cause any more trouble until the end of the reign of Christ, the thousand-year reign of Christ, and then they're brought out of there for the final judgment. They didn't want to be bound. They didn't want to be put in this place. We'll call it hell. They, did, they prefer pigs over hell, and, and demons apparently are insecure about existing outside of a warm body. That's a superstition, but it seems to be true. And so they're saying, don't take us out of these men and put us in the abyss, their version of at least short-term hell, take us out of these men and put us into the pigs instead. And so he said to them, go, with authoritative words, and immediately they were released. So they came out and went into the pigs, and the whole herd rushed down the steep bank into the lake and died in the water. Okay, so we know that the demons didn't die in the water, it could be, I mean, there's a lot of speculation. It could be that the pigs jumped in the water, and as they drowned in the water, the, the demons were then sent into the abyss, and the water could be a metaphor for that. Or it could be that as the, the pigs drowned, the demons were left homeless and, it, and just existing there in the atmosphere. And so that would beg the question, and we don't have the information. We can only speculate. This is Pastor Brian speculating because I got this little clever thing I'm going to do at the end. They had to go somewhere. They had to take themselves and their perfect but bad theology and go somewhere. Now, either Jesus sent them into the abyss and there's no evidence of that, or they found the next warm body they could get into to seek, you know, protection. So hold on to that thought. we got a little twist coming. It says in the next verse that those that were tending the pigs ran off. They were terrified by this. All of a sudden, these two violent men were set into their right mind. This legion of uh, demons in the atmosphere must have been absolutely sinister. Jumped into their pigs. The pigs ran down the hill, and they went into the water, and they drowned. It had to be uh, quite a financial loss. You know, pork bellies have always been quite the commodity. And so they ran off, went into the town and reported all of this, including what happened to the demon-possessed men. They wanted to know, they went and they said, the pigs are dead and the men are okay. And to them, that was not a good report, that was a bad report. They cared more about their pigs than they did about these men because we know these men were delivered and set into the right mind. We know uh, and from the other gospels that after they were delivered, they actually, one of them at least, said that he wanted to go with Jesus. He wanted to follow him. Like, he was going to get in the boat. He wasn't like the two that were frozen on the shore. And Jesus basically said, your assignment is to stay here in the Decapolis and tell your family and tell your friends and tell everybody all that I've done for them, for you, and that I will do for them as well, to stay there and to represent Jesus. Then the whole town 
went out to meet Jesus. And you would think they would be intrigued. You would think they would want to get a hold of this power and this authority. Maybe he's there to help them the same way he helped the demon-possessed men. But when they went and saw him, they pleaded with him to leave their region. So they understood, back to my original point, that Jesus was powerful, that he had authority, that he was great, and that he was awesome. There was evidence right in front of them that he would use this power and authority for things such as deliverance, for good and not for bad, but they didn't understand that well enough. They were mystified by it just like the demons. There's a twist here. Those who were in their right mind lost their mind. They're standing face to face with the Messiah, the Savior, who's provided evidence that he's powerful and has provided evidence that he's good, but they don't, and they certainly believe that he's powerful, which is where the fear comes from, but they don't believe he's good. They seem to be possessed with the same theology that were in these demons. It makes me think the demons went and jumped on them and gave them this insane response. And those who were not possessed became possessed, and those who were possessed became dispossessed because they were the ones who wanted to follow Jesus. Quite ironic, isn't it? And so they were confused. And instead of embracing the Messiah who had come to them, they rejected him. Not because he wasn't legitimate, not because he didn't have power, not because there wasn't evidence of their goodness, but because there was some kind of block, some kind of spiritual thing that said, he won't do it for us. He won't do it for me. His coming isn't good news. His coming is bad news. Here's the verdict. Light has come into the world, but men love darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil, and they would not come into the light for fear that their deeds will be exposed. Uh, got some tough news for you. You come to God. You come into the light. Your stuff is going to end up on the table. But the good news is, by grace, through faith, in his words, in the sufficiency of the cross, those who do believe that God is good, not just powerful and awesome, but good, will come into the light and find that their sins have been forgiven and they've been given the right to become sons and daughters of God. That's the transaction. It's real, it's powerful, it's invasive. To come into the presence of God is to come into the presence of his word. His word is sharp, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates the soul and spirit. It lays everything bare before him to whom we must give an account. But the good thing is, the truth that it conjures up in us is laid according to his truth. It gives us the opportunity to confess. It gives us the opportunity to repent. It gives us the opportunity to enter into a right uh, relationship, life-saving relationship with him. And it gives us the opportunity to see his power and his authority work for us rather than against it. What is the great flaw of the prosperity teachers of our time who will come to repentance themselves? Many of them, I believe, who truly love Jesus. The great flaw in that theology, if you watch these guys hours after hours after hours, what they say about God's power and his authority and his willingness to use it for you to bring increase and to bring salvation in your circumstances is absolutely true. The flaw in their theology, the flaw in their teaching is they don't deal with sin. You cannot pay off your sin by writing me or some televangelist a check. Oh, if wishing made it so. You come to the cross, you let Christ write the check through his blood you confess, you repent you submit and just like he rose from the dead, you will rise from the dead just like he ascended into the kingdom of heaven you will ascend to the kingdom of heaven and he will pour out his Holy Spirit and make sure it's true bottom line the apostle Paul said it well Hebrews 11 verse 6 without faith it is impossible to please God because anyone and everyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he, and I would add absolutely, without equivocation, not maybe, not sometimes, not depending on who you are, anyone and everyone, that he rewards those who do earnestly seek him. Without faith that he is real, without faith that he is powerful, without faith that he is good, without faith that he, uh, uh, faith in w- that he sees you in your circumstances, that he desires to move that way and to bring himself glory through your salvation and your circumstances. Without faith... It's impossible to please him. That's how we receive grace. And and faith that he will do it toward, he will bring that goodness toward people who are living in a life and caught up in sin because 
that's the way it is for each and every one of us we can't allow our sin to become an idol that exalts itself over the grace of God that's a huge mistake as well and so um, I say as Jesus said and so many others have said before me in his name and by his power and with his authority I speak it over this congregation whether it be in the room or online be delivered from this demon of unbelief and fear May it be cast out of us, between us, relationally, in the room, in the atmosphere, and in our hearts and in our minds. Be cast, let it be cast away, this fear that God will not show up for you. Be set free from it. Be delivered from it. You may know that he's powerful. You may know that you need to fear him. Fine, but you also need to know that he loves you and you can trust him. Be set free from this view of God that he is an angry grandfather sitting in heaven waiting to take you down. Be set free from this idea that, that you have to perform to receive his salvation. You just have to believe. We're justified by faith and nothing else. Be delivered. And as you're delivered and as you're set free in the name of Jesus Christ, by his power and by his authority, the demons have to squeal out of here and go to some pigs. No longer in his people then you, with that freedom, go back to his throne of grace in your time of need. Go boldly, which means to go confidently. Not thinking maybe you'll receive mercy because the verse says you will receive mercy. Not thinking maybe you'll receive grace because you will receive grace through faith and words. Go boldly to his throne of grace knowing that he can and knowing that he will. That's how he wants to build his kingdom. It's the only way this church is going to get built. And you and I have been chosen to be the benefactors of that, to be his poster ch children, those through whom he illustrates the power of the coming of the kingdom of heaven despite the world being on fire, those to whom and through whom he illustrates salvation in the midst of a world gone wild. We are the poster children for salvation in our relationships, in our body, in our circumstances, in our mind, in our heart, in our finances, in our careers, in everything. So that the world may know that he loves them the way he loves us and be invited in to a life-saving encounter with him. We need to not be any more clever than that and we can't be an ounce less more powerful. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we love you. We praise you. We thank you for your word. We thank you for your spirit. We thank you that you have brought this church, this place, these people, this congregation to a clear understanding of what you want to do for us and through us to build your kingdom and to establish this church. We thank you and praise you, Lord, that when we speak your word, we don't speak the words of men. We don't speak some ancient uh, knowledge or wisdom that came from men that, as good as that may be we speak the powerful the almighty the authoritative word of God which never returns void and always accomplishes its purpose when we cast demons out of people in the name of Jesus then indeed even if there's no pigs around they are delivered and when we go boldly to your throne of grace the Holy Spirit transports us to you and you to us and we do have a life-saving encounter with you where you do immediately receive us with mercy and begin to dispense words upon our life that we might find grace come and work in the most miserable of circumstances among us and bring salvation and bring a testimony that glorifies you and lets the world know that the cross is sufficient we can't wait to see what you're going to do in our lives and the life of this church in the days ahead. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.